just a typical kid going to school. My sister got very, very sick and she had an incurable kidney disease at the time. My sister would have to be to Children's Hospital and back then they wouldn't let children go in to see. So we had to stay outside while she was up in the window and we would wave at her, you know, wave, hi Kathy. <laughs> and she's, and, you know, she'd be there for weeks and weeks. My mom would be up there with her and me and my little sister would be downstairs you know, outside, and it was right on the banks of a great lake. So we would be sitting on the the bank. It was huge. It looked like the ocean to, to me when, as a little kid. It was really big. But there were these great big boulders, and we'd sit on those boulders, and there'd be all these dead fish, <laughs> all these fish everywhere. It, it reminded me of the mood of how I felt at the time. I felt dead inside. My sister was was dying. It was a very painful time. And then um, we got her home and got her stable. And then, then I got very sick and um, inhaled a spore in my lung and it grew. I was probably eight, eight or nine. I had, it went into sarcoidosis in my lung. My fever was like 106 degrees. My whole body hurt. There you are, this little tiny kid and you're really sick and you're in this big hospital all by yourself. That was my first encounter with an angel. <laughs> there was a man, he would come every single day and he would take me to have the x-rays that I needed to have done daily. Of course, I was in isolation, so I couldn't have any visitors or anything. So he was the only visitor besides my mom that could come and see me. And he would take me in the wheelchair and do pop wheelies and, and try to get me to laugh and that kind of thing. At night, when I was alone, after my mom had to go back home, when I was alone, there were times when I would wake up and he would be sitting in the corner of the room and he would be so I mean, there would be a light, this golden light, all around him. He never said anything, um, but he would be sitting there in the room watching over me while I slept. And he always made me so happy, always made me feel so protected and so cared about. And then one day, um, I was just so tired of being in the hospital, so tired of being sick. And I asked him if, I, if he thought I was going to ever get better. And he said, yeah, you're going to get better. But you're going to go home tomorrow. And the doctor came in and said, yeah, you're going to go home. <laughs> I got to go home. I will never forget his face. I will never forget that golden light that surrounded him, ever. The love that just ex exuded out of him was unbelievable. And I know that angels can, you know, their essence is spirit and their station as angel and they can appear as anything that they need to in order to get the job done that God's asked them to do. And I I just knew, I mean, I just knew. It, when I got older, I knew. I, when I was younger, it was like, I didn't, I just knew I trusted him. I knew that I felt comfort and safe. And when my mom wasn't there, he was there. Yeah, it was kind of like, I just can't wait to get back to being a kid. And then, then we got the news that we were moving. My dad worked for DuPont. So he got transferred to West Virginia, and that was it. Coming from Chicago to West Virginia was big, big, big culture shock. It was a big deal. My mom, she wanted us to take swimming lessons. So we took swimming lessons up at the Y. And that's where I had my first, and that was about the age of 13. I was swimming in the pool, and the in my instructor wanted us to dive head first like this into to the 10-foot section of the pool. And I watched all the other kids do it, and they did fine and got out of there fine. But I just had this, this foreboding. I, just, I couldn't do it. I, no matter how much I stood there and watched everybody else come out okay, I just couldn't do it. Diving with my head first into 10 feet of water, it just terrified me. And he didn't honor that at all. 
said, you are either going to do this dive or I'm going to throw you in. And he grabbed me and he threw me in. I just went right to the bottom. I took in a bunch of water. I was surprised at how quickly I drowned, laying on the bottom. And I remember looking up and I could see the water rippling. And it was very strange because I could also see my mom who was in the balcony clear across the other side of the pool, um, up in the balcony where the parents were sitting. And I could see her face and she was just, she had this horror, horror filled look on her face. I could see the lady on the other side of the pool that had the little kids in the lifeguard. And, and here I am under 10 feet of water well, while all this was going on and I'm watching all of this stuff and it looked like their faces were like right here. And, and I could just see them so clear. Just like I'm sitting here talking to you, I could hear. And I heard that, like I said, that one lady that was clear on the other end at the three foot section with the little kids, she yelled out, go in and get her. His eyes were big and glassy and he could not move. I mean, it was just like, as all of this stuff was going on, and I'm laying there, I see this light, you know, above me. It looked like a light bulb. And I said, well, what? To myself, I said, well, what is a light bulb doing in a pool? That light, it was, this, was white and it was bright, but it was soft at the same time. And I felt warm and, and cocooned like I was wrapped in a blanket. I felt no pain, I felt no fear, none, nothing. I felt this love that came through that light like you wouldn't believe. And that light just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm not sure if I was moving up to it or it was moving down to me, but it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And just as that light was about to touch me, I mean, it was like this close to me. And all of a sudden I hear what sounds like a metal door slam and it echoed. The light was gone and I felt all this horrendous pain and I was coughing and throwing up water and the lifeguard, what had happened was the lifeguard that was behind me that had the middle-aged kids had jumped in and he was pulling me out of the water and he was squeezing my stomach and, and trying to get me to breathe. And they, he got me to the side of the pool and was working with me to get me to breathe. And then I guess when I came out of it, only thing I remember was looking to my side and I saw everybody's ankles and legs up to their knees. You know, there's all these legs standing around me. Then I saw my mom. But then after, after that was over, we went home. Not another word was said about it. Nothing. Mm. We didn't talk about it. I, I don't know if it frightened, you know, it was so frightening that, that n nothing was spoke about it. I didn't talk about it. I didn't know what it was. You, know, you watch your child die in front of you, and that's frightening. I was really physically in shock, and I think um, emotionally I was in shock because I had no idea what just happened. No idea whatsoever. How do you see all the things that I saw, and you hear all the things, that, and you're on the bottom, and you, you have stopped breathing, and you, I knew I did, but I didn't know what that light was. I became extremely emotional after that happened. And I noticed that my parents and, and my sisters and everybody around me were kind of like, you're kind of weird. <laughs> you're kind of strange. What's going on with you? Something is not right with you. But I didn't know what, what was going on. I was just a little girl. I remember being able to smell like spirits and things. When I was about 15, um, there were some things happening that um, were very difficult. Seeing spirits and, you know, other things. There were other things, too. When I went and talked to an adult about it, the adult told me, no, that didn't ha this wasn't happening. And it was like, this stung all in your head. It's not real, you know. It was just big enough that it was, and, and that I took it to an adult and I said, you know, this is what's happening. And the adult said, no, no, it's not happening. It's all in your head. It's not happening. 
Well, I knew it was. And I started questioning my own sanity. And I had planned to kill myself, but I didn't tell anybody. It was a good Friday and we were singing in, the, in a church, in my a youth choir. While we were in the lower part of the church waiting to go upstairs to have our turn to sing, we were practicing, the, the choir was practicing. And I was sitting in the back row there was two ladies sitting in front of me and two daughters of one of those ladies sitting in front of them and then the rest of the choir. And I, I was just kind of a loner and I sat in the back. Well, I noticed that there was a man that had come in and he was approaching. And as he got closer, it was like, oh my God, no, that's Jesus. And here I am 15 years old and Jesus walks in and he's, and I was just like, my mouth was as dry as a bone. I couldn't speak. I couldn't say anything. And he walked in and he sat down next to me in the chair. And he looked at me and he smiled. And I was like, oh, I couldn't, I mean, I didn't know what to do. When, when he walked in, immediately I sensed there's holiness. Holiness is in this room. Oh my gosh, he was so beautiful. But he was dressed just like, normal. I mean, he was, he had on a white uh, button-down shirt. He had on a pair of blue jeans and a pair of boots. And he had, he was probably about 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 he was slim built, but you could tell he was muscular. He had dark olive complexion, uh, very brown eyes. Um, but what was interesting about the eyes is when I looked deep into his eyes, when he was sitting next to me and I looked, really looked deep into his eyes, I could see his soul. And his soul looked a, a brilliant a blue. Um, it was like he was pure and spotless and cleansed and clean and holy. And you know, it just, I don't know why I could see blue when I looked in his eyes, although his eyes were just as liquid brown as, I mean, they were just beautiful brown. Um, he had a close cut beard and his hair was very long and very dark and wavy. And when he smiled, he had dimples. <laughs> and it was just, he had the most beautiful smile I, I've ever seen. And he said, um, where do I go to sit? And I just couldn't say anything at all. So the two ladies that were sitting in front of me turned around and they were talking to him and they were telling him, you know, explaining how to get upstairs and, you know, whatever. Well, at the same time he was talking to them, he turned and was talking to me. And he said, what is happening to you in your life is happening. You're not crazy. I love you. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Nobody knew. Nobody knew what was going on in my head. Nobody. But for him to say that to me, I was just like, <laughs> I couldn't stop staring at him. I mean, it was just like, he probably thought that was hilarious because here I am, my mouth is hanging to the ground and my, I, I could, but I, my mouth was so dry, I couldn't say a word. And it, I'm thinking that maybe he, it was like that so that I would be quiet and listen to what he had to say because what he had to say was very important. You know, what's happening to you is happening. You're not crazy. I'm with you. Well, I no longer entertain the idea of killing myself. You know, that was the end of that. And then he got up. And when he got up, he put his finger on the elbow of the lady who was sitting in front of me. And she had arthritis so bad in her arm that she couldn't bend her arm. And when he touched her elbow, it healed her elbow. And so she, we all went upstairs. He went upstairs. We finished practicing. Then it was our turn. So we went up there. And this, we, I even remember the song. It was up to Jerusalem. So we were standing up there on the altar, and we were singing. And only those four women and myself out of that whole choir saw him. He sat right in front of us. I just sang my heart out to him. I just sang and sang and sang. And then when we were, and during the song, he kind of did this, put his hands over his face. And he, 
that sun came through that window and just highlighted him and he was just magnificent. He was just beautiful. But then when the song was over and he got up and he kind of walked away, but he didn't leave the church because, I mean, there's only one door in and one door out and he didn't go out as far as I could see. And the, we were going, did you see Jesus? Did you see Jesus? And the other people in the choir were like, Jesus, what are you talking about, Jesus? We didn't see Jesus. I said, he was sitting right in front of you. You would have had to trip over him not to see him. He was right there. And But nobody else saw him, just, just us five people, me and those four ladies. We, we all talked about it for years. Do you remember when we saw Jesus in the church? Oh, yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. Do you remember? Do you remember? I mean, every couple of years I would call them up and, do you still remember that? Did that really happen? Was that in my head? Um, I had oh, such a deep love for Jesus, such a deep love for him. It was, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was, he was always on my mind, always in my heart and not far from my lips, if anybody would listen to me, and most wouldn't. I've had a lot of people talk to me about this, and they say, well, we know that he is a historical figure. We know that he did exist, he did get crucified, and he did do this and this and this. And I said, well, <clears throat> if you know that he was a historical figure, and you know that he was crucified, and you know that he did this, this, and this, and you're reaching out and you want to know more about him than, and you want to have interaction with him, then you can sit down and talk to him just like I'm talking to you, for one. And two, knowing of someone and knowing someone are two different things. So I said, learn as much about him as you can, for one, and two, start talking to him because you can't have a relationship with someone you don't talk to. You don't interact with at all. And if you sit quietly and listen and quiet all the mind chatter and quiet, quiet the clock and I gotta be there. Oh my gosh, I got five minutes. Okay, Jesus, I got five minutes. Your time is ticking, T start talking. No, that's not how it works with him, you know? And sometimes he doesn't even have to speak Sometimes he will show you things, you know. When you pray about something and you ask, if you ask for it and you really feel it in your heart and you ask for it, you are going to get it, you know. So if you ask for patience, you're going to get patience. If you ask for clarity, you are going to get clarity. If you ask for mercy, you're going to get mercy because that's the way he is. I was sitting on my back steps talking on a cordless phone and it was starting to rain. I hear this rumbling in the distance and I was like, oh no. And then, then a loud crack. And that lightning came down and just hit my right arm. And after it went, it passed through my body and left char marks on the concrete steps where I was sitting. But that, that searing pain, I will never forget that it was it was an instant burning, searing, agonizing pain when that lightning hit my arm and it radiated into my chest. The next thing I know, my spirit is just peeling up out of me like you're peeling a banana and it just peeled right up out. The next thing I know, I was in my house, but nothing in my house was my stuff. And I, I did not know at that particular moment that I was dead. I had no idea what was going on. I knew I was hit by lightning. You're not in pain, so something's happened. What is really going on? You know, why is everything in here weird looking? This is your house. You know this is your house. You know how to get around in it. You know the rooms, but nothing in this house is yours. And everything had this weird burnt gold look to it. And I go in, I'm standing in the kitchen and I'm looking at the curtains where the sink is, the lace curtains on, and they were not my curtains. And I was like, that is odd. So then I go and I walk into the dining room and the dining room furniture was not my stuff. 
I heard this old time radio show playing something like back in the days of the Waltons. And I couldn't figure out where in the world that was at. Because we had no power, so how could there be an, a radio playing with no power? And there were no lights, nothing. And I knew my husband had just walked in the door, but he was nowhere to be found. My children were in the house and they were nowhere to be found. And so I walked from the dining room into the living room and I'm looking and I go from the living room to the parlor, which is the front area, and looking for this radio, which was loud and it was like, you know, it had to be somewhere, but I couldn't find it. I was like, where is this? And I started to panic. I mean, this was, this was like really, really weird. And I had no idea what was going on and I felt frustrated because I didn't know where anybody was. I didn't know what this furniture was doing in my house. <laughs> where was I at? You know, what was happening to me? And then just as I started to really um, lose it, um, there was this huge, loving, formless presence. I couldn't see this presence, but I could feel this presence and he was huge, 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 big, as big as the house. And it just wrapped me up. You know, it was like being wrapped in this soft, warm blanket. And I had recognized that feeling before from when I was a little girl. This was a lot bigger love than the, the light that came through the, you know, what, because that was the light. But this was just, but it was the same kind of love. And it was, it just filled every cell in my body. Every pore was just, it, it, I felt like there was light coming out of every pore in my body. And I was just filled with this love like I've never, I, I, I could never put into words. And I had never experienced except for years ago when I was little, but that still was mild compared to this. As I was with this loving presence, it was, I kind of went, we went sideways. We didn't go up, we didn't go down. We moved lateral as if you were walking from one room in your house to another room, sideways. And the, we went through these beautiful pink and gold clouds. They were magnificent. The clouds were just lined with gold. You know, they were pink and fluffy and just absolutely the most magnificent things you've ever seen in your life. And so we were, but we were moving very rapidly through these pink and gold clouds. And then we got to the end of the pink and gold clouds and there was this magnificent garden. And it was, and I, and I was kind of like, okay, and how did we get here? And what is this? And, and but I was in, just in the wow factor because the colors were so beautiful and there were flowers everywhere and I heard birds and, you know, there were animals and the, there was a stream and that stream sparkled like diamonds. It, the water was blue and just, it was so beautiful. Just at the entrance, I mean, this was, all of this was just at the entrance of the garden, this magnificent beauty. And two men appeared um, and came to greet me. And at first I thought they were angels. They had um, this ivory linen clothing. They were wearing ivory uh, linen and it was a tightly woven like a herringbone weave and it's the I don't know why the weave stuck out but it was like the weave jumped off their shirt and was right here in my face right here look at this look at this pattern this pattern means something I don't know what it meant but that's exactly what it was I first thought they were angels they were young men about between 25 and 30 and they looked like they'd been out on the beach all day. Like, you know, they were glowing. They were beautiful. Their hair was a darker blonde curly and had this color running through it, you know, highlights. And when they smiled, it was like, I know who you are. These were my two brothers who had died when they were babies. And now they were fully grown men. And they looked just like my dad when my dad was a young man. When they smiled, it was like, oh my gosh, well, you know. And we just had this wonderful family reunion. It was just amazing. I kept telling him, dad would be so proud of you. Dad's gonna be really proud of you. <laughs> You're so, they were so beautiful. But all I can remember is their gorgeous smiles. They're absolutely beautiful smiles. 
and they were smiling from ear to ear constantly. And I was like, oh, she looked just like dad. You know? <laughs> and I couldn't get over it. And um, it was like, I'm so happy to see you. And I remember you and I know you and you know me and you know, that kind of thing. Michael got on one side of me and Stephen got on the other side of me and we walked and walked a little bit further into the garden. And as we did that, the, that huge loving presence that was with us got behind me. So it was like the three of us with this big, huge loving presence behind me. And we stopped. And when we stopped, we kind of turned this way. And there was like, it was like a screen watching a screen and my life on an old-fashioned movie reel. This is a black and white screen, an old-fashioned movie on an old-fashioned movie reel, and this was my life review. And not only did I have my two brothers with me and this huge loving presence, who I knew was God, there was a whole bunch of other people that came, and they were Oh, they were loving on me too, you know, and I was like, I know them and they know me, but I didn't know from where I knew them from. And they were from all different time periods. And I noticed their clothes. That's what I noticed. The women were wearing these beautiful, some of, well, not all of them, but some of them were wearing beautiful gowns, you know, and I saw men in fancy suits. I saw people in regular clothes like us. And it was like, how do I know you? but I do know you and you know me. And they were, and it was like, we were having another family reunion with all these people, but they were all gathered around for love and support. And I was supposed to be watching this movie. And so I was watching this movie and it was from every, from the moment I was born until that time that I died, but it was over that fast. And I thought, I missed something. Something's missing here. And because there was no judgment, none at all. I didn't judge myself. I mean, I learned that the only judgment we have is when we judge ourselves, standing with God there. And all God does is love you through it. He doesn't judge you. Well, I didn't judge me either. I just watched it. I was kind of going with the flow. I was like, could have knocked me over with a feather with everything that was going on. There is no price to be paid. You're not going to be punished. He's not standing there with a boing, a bong to boing you on the back of your head. Okay, you did this, smack. Or you did that, smack. There's none of that. Because I, I even asked my brothers, I said, am I missing something? My life seems pretty boring. You know, what, what? I heard God's voice. It was a man's voice. It was a gentle voice. It wasn't booming and angry. It was a gentle voice, but he said, what you put out into the universe will come back to you. And I had never heard words like that before. I didn't know what in the world that meant. And then all of a sudden it was like being hooked up to a giant IV bottle of knowledge. I started getting all of this divine knowledge and it was one aha moment after another. It was um, I was getting answers to questions that mankind has been asking since the beginning of time, but I didn't know how to ask those questions. I didn't even have to ask them before I had the answers. And it was like, I was just blown away. You know, I call it the wow factor again. And it was like, oh my gosh, this God, you are so awesome. And I kept saying this over and over, God, you are so awesome. And we human beings, we make everything so complicated and you're not complicated at all. You're very simple. And this is just so cool, you know? <laughs> and I, it was just all of this information was coming to me and, you know, and it was like seeing these scientists with these chalkboards that are 10 miles long and they have these equations that are 10 miles long to explain one little theory. That's not how it is. God was saying, that's too complicated. They, ha everybody, you guys make everything so complicated. And we do, you know, it's really not that complicated. It's like God took this with this, put it together, and there you have it. It's the little things that you do 
It's the little things, the loving things, or the not so loving things. It, it's not these grand, great, big, humongous things that people think they have to do in order to earn your way into heaven because you can't earn your way into heaven no matter what you do, for one. And for two, it's the little things. It's the, the smile you gave to someone whose life was really a mess, the hand on the shoulder. It's the you know, sharing your toys when you were little. It, it's the, uh, here, you lost your sweater and you're cold, here's my sweater. You know, little things, things you don't think would matter at all. That's the stuff that matters. You know, I've got a high school education. I've got a year of trade school, you know, beauty college. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a scientist. I'm not, you know, I'm just a country, a country bumpkin that live in West Virginia. And I, I'm a housewife. I take care of my kids and my grandkids, you know, and I, I don't have any knowledge about anything really. And so I'm getting all this huge, huge knowledge. And I'm just blown away. I'm just like, wow, wow, God, you're so awesome. You're so, I just keep saying, you're so awesome, God. I tell people about the vibrations. Heaven is moving at such a fast vibration. It is so high. It is so heavenly. <laughs> Even though it's right here. You're not going up, way up in the sky, in the clouds, sitting on a big cloud, playing a silver harp or whatever. That's not, I didn't go up and I didn't go down. I moved sideways. And so what taught me that heaven is no further away than your own backyard. It's no further away. And you can have heaven right here, right now. It's just a matter of your perception. And it is the most beautiful place there Oh my gosh, there is no judgment and there is no punishment and the consequences is not a punishment. It just is what it is. Here's somebody who is deeply wounded and they get physically hurt so they get on pain medication for that and they realize that that not only takes care of their physical pain but it takes care of their emotional pain too so they just keep taking it. Well, and then they become mean, or they mix it with alcohol, or they do whatever, or they step up from pills to whatever. I thought, okay, I'm dead. I've gone through all of this already. So I wanted to know if I still had a body. I noticed my brothers had bodies, all these other people had bodies, and everybody was dressed. So that was a big deal. So I looked down the front of me like this. And I could see my hair down the front of me. I could see my shirt, my pants, my feet. And I was like, I've still got a body. You know? And, but it was a light body. It wasn't heavy and weighed down by gravity. It doesn't feel like the kind of bodies that we have, you know, like what, how you feel, how I feel, which is, you know, heavy. And, you know, it didn't feel like that. It felt as light as a feather and I glowed like everybody else was glowing, you know? And it was like, oh my goodness. And I felt beautiful. For the first time, I felt beautiful and I felt cared about and loved and accepted and people weren't judging me because I didn't have my hair done right or my makeup on or I wasn't too, you know, was I too fat or was I not dressed you know, mm -hmm. well enough or whatever, because everybody loved me and accepted me. And I felt so beautiful. And I never felt that way. I mean, I did when I was a child growing up, but when I would became an adult, the relationships that I'd had and the, and the, uh, the world told me, you're not worth anything. Yeah. You're ugly, you're this, you're that, whatever. But I didn't feel that at all. And it was so wonderful. Well, one of the things that I learned at that point is that I still looked like me. I still felt like me. I still thought like me. I was still me. The only thing that died was my physical body. I am not my physical body. 
you are not yours. That there is, we are souls that have spirits. And that's, that is the part of us that lives forever. That is not going to go away. That is not going to die. Your physical body will, just, but, but you will still be you. You will still think the way you think. You will still feel like you. You will look like you, only better. My brothers and I con continued walking through the garden, and I was noticing the, the landscapes, and I saw some buildings. Um, and it was like there was this beautiful city, and in the middle of the city was this building that had a beautiful golden dome. It was huge. And there were other buildings on the outskirts of the city. So I'm standing in this garden, and there was also a field stone wall that had beautiful pink roses growing up and over the wall. And I know God put that there because I love pink roses. <laughs> so he puts this, you know, I'm seeing the these gorgeous pink roses and, and then all these other flowers that are, the reds are redder, the pinks are pinker, the yellows are yellower, and it just, everything was so beautiful. So I could see these buildings on the outskirts of the city. Um, and there's a wall around the city and then the buildings on the outskirts of the city. And I noticed um, houses. I could see individual, look like homes, people's homes. And there was one that was like, it looked like it was on a um, hillside or a cliff side and there mm -hmm. was uh, like ocean. You could see the waves. And the house was like, I don't know, it was made out of some kind of stone that glistened. Uh, it, it, as some kind of crystal or something. It was absolutely beautiful. And I saw another house that looked something like a, um, like an English cottage made of stone also. And there were the most beautiful gardens in the back part of the house and like in the backyard. They have roses everywhere. Of course, I love roses, but I, so I zoom right in on the roses, you know. I saw buildings that had these beautiful healing pools and I, was given the information that those were people who have died from traumatic deaths or very quick deaths and they don't know that they're dead. They are taken to places like that and they're gently brought to the awareness of what's happened. There are angels and mentors and teachers and loved ones who have passed on and that becomes their job to greet people that have come and you know that have just died and they greet you and they they get you acclimated to where you are and they they're very gentle about what they do you know and um there's a i saw a building and and these buildings are like alabaster you know marble and they're magnificent they were so beautiful and there was one building and and i saw some children and i after seeing my brothers, I was also realized that babies and children who die, they are taken care of by angels and loved ones who are specifically trained to help these children grow. And they grow physically, but they also grow spiritually. And they're, you know, and that's what happened with my brothers when they died. They were just babies and they grew up to be beautiful young men. And I saw, it looked like a giant library. The walls were just lined with thousands and thousands of books for every subject you could possibly think of. And I know that there, and I saw um, schools there, but these are not schools of science like we have here. These are schools for spiritual growth. You can like go to spiritual college, <laughs> you know? So I saw things like that, uh, rolling, I saw rolling hills and valleys and places where our pets go, animals, you know, they run free, they roam free, um, horses and cows and ducks and all of them, you know, anything. And then I heard this music that was the most magnificent music I've ever heard in my life. The leaves on the trees have a vibration. Each blade of grass has a vibration. 
the rocks that were in the stream that sparkled like diamonds. The water has a vibration, the rock has a vibration, the animals. Everything has its own vibration, even the colors. If you imagine the colors of a rainbow, each color has its own vibration. So a rainbow is not just a rainbow, that pretty to look at, but it's also a vibration. You can hear a rainbow, if you, you know, because each color has its own sound. So when you take all of those individual sounds and you put them together, it was the most magnificent orchestra and choir I've ever heard. And though everything was singing praises to God, it was just amazing. What I, I've told people this before that have, that have written to me or called me and they don't feel that God loves them or they feel alone or whatever and I said stop and think about this for a second God loves you as if you were the only one he ever created and he loves you so much that he thinks about you every single second of every single day and if he stopped thinking about you you would just poof you would cease to exist as if you never were. So you know that he loves you so much. Like I said, as if you were the only one. And he loves each one of us as if we were the only one he ever created. There is a beautiful life after this life. And the, the, the things that are happening in this world, the horrors that you're talking about, um, that happens because of people's selfishness. You know, God gives us free will. He's a gentleman. He's not going to step in and say, wait a second, that's this person's sacred space. Don't go in there. You stay over here in your little corner. You know, he doesn't do that. We have to learn as, as, a, as, a, as humankind, as people, that we are here to learn how to love and be loved. And there are many kinds of love, but that the kind of love that we are here to learn how to, to do is the agape love. It's the way that God loves us, unconditionally, no strings attached. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to do anything to get it. He just loves you. He likes you and he loves you, period. And you don't have to do anything for it. Having said that, there are people out there who don't honor other people's sacred space and they're selfish and they want what they want. And so they're going to impose their free will onto someone else. And that's how a lot of children get hurt. People get, you know, people get raped, people get murdered. You know, it's, it's yeah. selfishness, pure and simple. The opposite of love is not hate. It's selfishness, and hatred is born out of selfishness. After I got the um, the download of information, and I I got an understanding of what he meant by what you put out into the universe will come back to you, because I had never heard words like that before. And it was like, if you could imagine a boomerang and how a boomerang spins and spins and goes up and then comes back. Okay, so this is a, a boomerang effect. But if you put out love and respect and, and um, caring and compassion, that's what you're going to get back. If you put out lying and cheating and stealing and, and, and those kinds of things, that's what you're going to get back. But what happens is the things that you think, the things that you say, and the things that you feel go out, come out of you, go out into the universe, spin, gain momentum, and then come back and they get you. And it's, you don't know when, you don't know how. And people call this karma, people call this, uh, you know, whatever they call it. But it's like a natural law of God. It's just a normal, natural, God-made law. It's not a punishment. Good um, decisions make good consequences. Bad decisions make bad consequences.
that's, you know, you have to be very careful what it is. You, also, another thing that I learned is that what you fill, you fill your soul with those things you fill your life with. You don't put trash into your heart and your mind. So if you fill your life with beauty and love and compassion and good things, you watch good things on TV, you listen to good music. If you live that, you're filling your soul with that.